Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Federal Perspectives of Family Provider Relationships in Early Childhood Programs webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, we'll conduct a question and answer session. At that time, if you have a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. If at any time during the conference you need to reach an operator, please press star 0. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Wednesday, August 7, 2013. I'll now like to turn the conference over to Ms. Lu Gao. Please go ahead. Uh, welcome, everyone. Nancy, do you want to introduce the webinar first, please? Um, sure. So um, this is uh, my name is Nancy J. Lamargi, and I work in the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation. And I just want to welcome you all to our webinar today. We're delighted that you can join us, and that this topic is of interest to so many people. Um, actually, uh, I want to say that because there are so many people on the call, it will limit our ability to have an op the open discussion we were hoping to at the end. Um, so instead, what we are going to do is, um, because we are so interested in your questions and comments on this topic, um, instead of opening the phone lines, we ask that you submit any questions or comments you have via the chat option throughout the webinar. And we will read and address as many as possible, hopefully all of them, um, by the end of the uh, presentation today. Um, and so now I want to turn it over to Lou who will um, uh, go over how you can uh, enter a question. All right, thank you. So welcome everyone to the webinar. I just uh, want to go through some brief logistics as far as asking questions. You can ask questions at any time during the presentation. And to do that, we will be using the chat box at the screen showing right now. Uh, which you will see in the lower left corner of your screen. So to submit a question, please just type into the box and then hit send. So now I'm going to turn the call back to Nancy Margie. Nancy, go ahead. Okay. Um, so now I just wanted to, I'm delighted to introduce our panel members who represent a broad array of federal offices involved in early childhood programs and initiatives. Um, our first presenter will be Moshimi Beltangedi from the Office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Early Childhood Development in the Administration for Children and Families. Moshini is here to discuss the Maternal, Infant, and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program, and in particular the Tribal Home Visiting Program. Our second presenter, Richard Gonzalez, um, who is also from the office, office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Early Childhood Development in the Administration for Children and Families. Um, We'll discuss family engagement in relation to the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge Grants. Our third presenter is Kirsten Beigel from the Office of Head Start and the Administration for Children and Families. Our fourth presenter is Letha Chun from the Office of Child Care and the Administration for Children and Families. Uh, fifth, Rosie Gomez from the Office on Child Abuse and Neglect in the Children's Bureau will present. And finally, Monique Toussaint from the Office of, Office of Innovation and Improvement in the U.S. Department of Education will present. So next slide, please. Um, just for an overview, today we will examine commonalities as well as unique perspectives in family engagement priorities across program offices. In addition, each office is guiding uh, frameworks or principles, flexibility and regulations, and innovations from the field will be discussed. Um, we will also aim to address how research can be used to facilitate effective practice. Um, and in order to facilitate the discussion time at the end, we've developed three broad questions we would like everyone to consider during this webinar, and which we will also post, um, uh, I believe, in the chat option uh, for everyone to review as we're going through. Um, so our three questions, very broad questions, are what trends are you seeing related to family provider relationships and early childhood programs? What do you see as the top priorities for improving family provider relationships? And what information do you think researchers could provide to fill in critical gaps in knowledge? We've asked the presenters to discuss these after the presentations, but would also like your questions and comments on these topics or on other relevant topics to contribute to the discussion. So as we mentioned before, please type your questions and comments in the chat function as you think of them throughout the webinar, and we will share them during the discussion time at the end. Next slide, please. So the commonalities that we've identified that cut across program offices include, probably most obviously, um, an emphasis on the importance of family engagement and family provider relationships. Um, all program offices represented here acknowledge that positive family provider relationships are important for their work. 
For some programs, such as the Department of Education, this value lies primarily in the positive effect of strong family par provider relationships on children. For others, such as Head Start and Child Care, the value stems from the opportunity to facilitate positive outcomes for parents, such as increased self-efficacy, as well as positive outcomes for children, such as better developmental outcomes. A second commonality is the recognized need for partnerships in order to engage families. Although each program office varies somewhat in their definition of effective family provider relationships, each acknowledges that it entails developing a true partnership between families and providers. This partnership includes two-way communication, mutual respect, and collaborative work towards shared goals. Third, all offices acknowledge the need to be flexible in creating policies and criteria for requests for proposals and regulations related to family provider relationships. Although the actual policies, criteria, and regulations used to facilitate flexibility vary across program offices, all offices incorporate language that will allow for flexibility at the state or program level. This flexibility is intended to allow states and programs to support family provider relationships in ways that will most effectively accommodate cultural diversity, diversity across program structures, geographic considerations, and other related issues. So um, thank you again for joining us today, and now I will turn it over to Moshimi. Hi, thank you, Nancy. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. So I'm going to talk today about um, perspectives on family engagement in the maternal, infant, and early childhood home visiting program, and specifically the tribal home visiting program, which we administer here at ACF in partnership with the Health Resources and Services Administration Maternal and Child Health Bureau. So could you go to the next slide, please? So. Um, I think the biggest thing that we think about when we think about family engagement and home visiting is that, you know, in essence, home visiting is family engagement. So whereas in an early childhood education setting like a Head Start or child care classroom, um, you know, the child is the one that's getting most of the services and interactions with the family are happening outside of the classroom or, um, you know, as part of the, the work that's being done with children, in this case, it's the family that's the locus of the intervention. So engagement of parents, caregivers, and families is the core service delivery strategy. And the way that home visiting works is that home visitors work with parents in a positive, ongoing, and goal-oriented way and develop relationships to expand parent and caregivers' knowledge and skills to nurture child development, promote growth and healthy development of young children, and connect families to resources in the community. So again, you know, really engaging with the parents is the core of um, the service delivery in home visiting, and it's the core way that we think about home visiting making an impact on families and children. So just some considerations related to um, thinking about home visiting and family engagement. First is, um, some of the differences between engaging families in the home environment versus in an early care and education setting. So as I said, you know, when the locus of the intervention is the child, um, then you're really working with the parent outside of the classroom or as part of the classroom experience um, to help them think about how to support the children's learning that's happening outside of the home. In this case, in, in the case of home visiting, um, home visitor will be working directly with the parent to help them think about how to support their children's learning and development in the home and things that they specifically can do um, to support their children's learning and development and health. Um, and so that's, I think, one distinction to think about and I think um, probably uh, home visiting field could learn a lot from the family engagement strategies of the early care and education field and likewise that many of the strategies that home visitors use to engage families in an ongoing way would be relevant to the early care and education setting. And some of the specific strategies or issues that we face in home visiting related to family engagement are first are, are listed here. So first is participation versus engagement. So it's it's sometimes easy to get a family to participate in a home visiting program. You know, they will sit there when you come to visit them and listen to whatever the home visitor has to share. They'll listen to the lessons. They'll um, participate in whatever activity the home visitor wants to do on that day. But that's really different from having a family be truly engaged with home visiting um, and truly involved in what's happening. So I think there's a lot of 
um, literature in the home visiting field about how better um, to engage with families and really ensure that the interaction between the home visitor and the parent is fruitful and is really going to help um, the parent in their own um, development of skills as a parent, but also in, in supporting their children. Along with that, I think, is the issue of minimizing attrition. So, you know, if you don't have a family that's really engaged, there's a very high likelihood that there will be attrition across the, the span of the program. And I think um, many of the home visiting programs, the literature that's out there indicates that there's up to between 20 and 60 percent att attrition rate and sometimes more in home visiting programs. So I think we really struggle in home visiting in finding ways to maximize engagement and minimize attrition. And then finally, um, one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about is how to specifically engage fathers. So most home visiting programs have really been designed with the mother um, as the primary locus of intervention. Um, but you know, we all know that unless the father is engaged or unless other family members that are involved with the child are engaged, that um, the home visiting intervention is not as likely to be successful. So another consideration to think about is that there are different home visiting models. So for example, parents as teachers, nurse family partnership, Healthy Families America, Early Head Start home base. There's a variety of different models that are out there, um, and each of them probably has their own specific family engagement strategy. So that's just another level of um, something to think about when we think about home visiting and family engagement. Next slide. So in terms of fl flexibility, I wanted to give a little bit of context for how um, home visiting and family engagement might differ in tribal communities. So first, um, in our program, we really hear a lot about um, the fact that many uh, families in tribal communities are intergenerational and that the home environments themselves are intergenerational. So you may have um, the, the, ch the child's parents as well as the child's grandparents and possibly great-grandparents in the home. You may have aunties or uncles. Um, you may have other people that are involved with the child and, and part of that child's life on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is very common in tribal communities, as it is in many other groups, such as immigrant communities. Um, but that's something to think about um, when you think about home visiting in tribal communities and family engagement. There's also similarly, um, to take into consideration community norms around child rearing. So this idea that you know the whole fam the whole community is involved in raising a child, and that children you know they often will go in and out of other families' homes, in and out of other people's homes in the community. So even though a child might live with their parent, they are often engaged with many other families in the community, and the community as a whole is thinking about raising that child or raising a group of children together. So that's another thing that we hear a lot from our tribal grantees. Similarly, the role of elders in the raising of, of children is, is very common in tribal communities. As I said, you know, you may have intergenerational families, and often the elder is really seen as, as the person that must be given a lot of respect to, um, and that the elder's opinions on child rearing are very important to the parent of the child, um, and so, you know, the home visitor really needs to think about engaging with the elder, with other generations, um, to ensure that the messages that are being sent about healthy child development, about parenting skills, are are really being understood by all all the folks that are involved with the child's life. Because I think it can be challenging for parents if they're hearing one thing from the home visitor and then another thing from you know, grandma or an elder in the community, and they don't know what to do. So I think, and that I think will probably make it more difficult for the home visitor to engage the family in a long-term and meaningful way if they, if the things they're sharing are, are conflicting with other things that the, the parent or caregiver is hearing. Um, some other cultural considerations. So first, that there sometimes is a d bit of a distrust of home visitors from outside the community. So I think the, the grantees that we've had that have been the most successful have had home visitors that are from the community, from the tribe, that people feel comfortable with. And often when they've had to bring in somebody from outside, it can be challenging for that home visitor to really develop the relationships. Not to say that it's impossible, but it just think, makes things more challenging. And finally, we've seen that um, some grantees, some of our grantees have needed to think about specific adaptations or enhancements to meet their culture and context um, that will help them 
um, engage with families. And I'll give a couple examples of that on the next slide. So could you move to the next slide, please? So these are some um, innovations from our tribal home visiting grantees. So first, the Port Gamble Squalum Tribe in Washington. They are using the Nurse Family Partnership Home Visiting Model, which is traditionally a model that's very rigid in the way that it's implemented um, and is traditionally only implemented with first-time mothers um, and is traditionally implemented by a single nurse visiting with a family and developing a relationship. And I think it's been a very successful model with that. But in tribal communities, what we have heard is that um, that adaptations are needed to make this model work. So first, um, they have been able to, uh, to work with um, multiparous women, so not just first-time women. Um, and then they've also um, integrated the, the Brazelton Touch Points framework into what they're doing. And the way that they have really in, ensured that families are engaged with this program is that the nurse, the NFP nurse, is not from the community. She's very young. Um, she's a great nurse, but she's not a tribal member. Um, and what they do to engage families is they pair her, partner her with a family support specialist or cultural liaison, and the two of them will visit with a family um, on the first visit and perhaps beyond to really ensure that there's a strong relationship. So this, this cultural liaison is an elder. She's well known in the community, and she's very respected. And, um, and often helps the nurse develop that relationship. And then another example is the Fairbanks Native Association um, in, in Fairbanks, Alaska. They're using the Parents as Teachers Home Visiting model, and they've talked about in family engagement that they move from a perspective of, we don't think we're better than the family. We go in as partners, we go in as helpers, but not as somebody who knows better. Um, and they have um, also done really well with having native home visitors and they finally also made adaptations to their lessons to meet the needs of their diverse Alaska native population. So use different cultural games or toys or other things that will help the family um, engage. So thank you. So this is uh, Richard Gonzalez. If we could go to the next slide. I'm going to be the next speaker. I'm going to talk to you about the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge and how it relate, how family engagement is plays out in, in this competition. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, for those of you who've seen, who saw the original competition when it came out in 2011, um, part of the competition, we had something called focused investment areas. And in the application, states could apply in, a, in our Section C, they had four four areas they could select from, and of those four investment areas, engaging and supporting families was one of those criteria to which they could choose to write. So those states that wrote to this understood uh, overall that all states obviously are going to be challenged by thinking about family engagement and how to improve it within its state. But certain states decided they were going to use some of the funding available and would really focus on investing in this area to further enhance what they do within the state around family engagement. So if you look here at the language, you'll see that the focus again was on the state developing a plan uh, that's culturally and linguistically appropriate. And it really had to do, remember, the entire competition was focused on school readiness. So how do we help families understand what they need to do and how to engage to support their child's school readiness as the child moves uh, from the earlier grades in, into the elementary grades. And so this is all about information and support. And you see from these three subcategories, A, B, and C, you see that there was a question of states needed to think about how they were going to focus across levels in looking at their program standards. They had to think about activities that would enhance enhance the capacity of families to support their child's education and their child's development. So thinking about what those activities might be and how they would play into the actual program standards that existed within a given state. Secondly, they needed to think about how they were going to increase the number and percentage of early childhood educators, making sure that they were trained and supported on an ongoing basis so that they could actually implement the family engagement strategies that were developed within the state to support those standards. 
And third, their idea was to make sure that family support and engagement was not limited to certain types of programs or service areas, but would be a statewide effort, and it would include leveraging across the various resources, of, across the various service models, and across the various stakeholders. Um, next slide. So what we have here is we have the, the, the reality that as as we did this competition, we wanted to make sure that there was tremendous amount of flexibility. Rather than, so we identify certain things that need to be addressed, but we left it up to the states to determine exactly how far they would go and to what degree, what kinds of strategies and activities they would develop within their state based on where they were in their own state's development and work in this area. So you'll see here on this slide that there were certain strategies we said they must address, and simple things like making sure there's two-way communication and not just one way, making sure that there's outreach to fathers and other family members, not just the mother, making sure that the social networks were in place and that we're thinking intergenerational. And you can see the other examples that are here. The idea was to name a few general areas that we wanted them to address but then to really give them the, uh, the flexibility to say, and you develop this further based on what your standards say, based on what your vision is for your state, based on where you, what you have developed so far or what you envision developing in the years ahead. And then we basically asked them for a documentation that would show the activities, the progression of the standards, the progression of the activities that would support this development over time. Um, next slide. So what I'd like to do is just spend a few moments talking about examples from states. And before, even though this is about Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge, it's important to note that the state advisory councils uh, really was an approach taken prior to RTTLC. In some ways, it set the stage for RTTLC because what it did was it really created a tremendous amount of flexibility to the state to have these state councils that across stakeholders within the state that would allow them to begin to think about the changes they need to make, better integration, coordination, collaboration across the various programs and stakeholders. So I want to start with some examples from the councils of some things they did related to family engagement because these councils then became important bodies, uh, uh, advisory groups, and in some case operational groups that drove the work that the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge states are now doing, that drive the work that they are now doing. So here are just some examples of the work. In Maine, they, for example, examined various metrics and evaluation tools and measured the degree of success of parent engagement strategies. So they said, well, we have lots of strategies, but it's time to try to figure out which ones are more effective, which are working better, and they created some tools that would allow them to begin to do that. In Missouri and Georgia, they developed family engagement recommendations for adoptive parents. So they, they realized in these states that this was a, a, a group of people, adoptive parents, who they, who they probably were not paying as much attention to in the ways they wanted to do that, and so they really focused on family engagement that would speak to this particular group. In New York, they developed certification for parent educators. They said, well, it's okay to have training and workshops for parent educators, but we actually want to send the message that family engagement is really important and the relationship between family and provider is important, so we're going to develop a certification process for those educators. In California, they began to work on early childhood educator competencies. So as you know, as, um, as you are probably aware, you know, the competencies describing the knowledge and skills and dispositions that educators need in order to provide the high quality care that, that they are to provide to children and families. And so one of the 12 areas uh, that they've developed in these, in these competencies is very specifically focused on family and community engagement. In Guam, there's a collaboration with the Guam Housing and Urban Renewal Authority, and they began to conduct parent outreach activities for families who reside in the government-subsidized housing. Again, a group of people who they felt were probably not being reached to the degree they needed to be reached, and so they began to think outside the box, who, who are we not talking to, and how do we build this collaborative effort? 
Also in Guam, they then, as a result, developed a quarterly newsletter that was geared toward dissemination to over uh, 1,100 parents and caregivers of young children to engage them in various child development topics. And at the same time, they really worked in sharing with staff of the WIC program, of the, the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for women, uh, women, Infants, and Children. They worked a, a program called Young Brains Can't Wait and really developed a relationship on how to share information about this training program to parents across the two program models. Um, so, and then what you have in Nebraska is, is a, an example here. They developed core messages for engaging parents, early care and education providers, and schools on the topics of school preparedness and prepared schools. So how do you bring all these players together and talk with one another about what it means for a school to be prepared and what it means for how you prepare families to, and children to enter into school? Um, there are obviously many other states we could give examples to, but I, we're going to go to the next slide. So uh, race to the top early learning challenge, some work examples here. So again, this is just a sampling of areas, but I wanted to talk about a few of the states. So North Carolina. North Carolina has a, ha, has a process by which they're focusing on what they call Head Start hub sites. We'll, and these hub sites, these central locations, are going to provide technical assistance and demonstration and coaching regarding family engagement strategies to the early childhood workforce in the non-Head Start early learning development programs around them. So these become resources for programs and family providers to give them the technical assistance and support. They have something in North Carolina's RTTLC grant called Transformation Zones. These are areas of the state that have limited resource, resources, and they were chosen for concentrated effort on how we're going to improve services and quality in those areas. So three counties within their transformation zones are implementing what's known as the Triple P Positive Parenting Program. And this Triple P po Positive Parenting Program is a parenting and family support system, and it's designed to prevent as well as treat behavioral and emotional problems in children and teenagers. So it aims to prevent problems in the family, in the school, in the community before they arise, and to create family environments that encourage children to realize their potential. So they took this model and they've begun to implement it within the transformation zones to see if the implementation of this program would make the kinds of impact, had the kinds of impacts they are uh, guessing it, they, that would exist. Maryland, on the other hand, has taken the Head Start Family, Parent, and Community Engagement Framework and they've really established, uh, they have a coalition group of people who meet on a regular basis to look at how they're doing in the area of family engagement and what they could be doing better. And they basically customize for Maryland's needs the, the Head Start Family Parent and Community Engagement Framework and, and, and taking into account some differences or tweaking it for differences that might be specific to their population. In Ohio, Ohio focused on its what uh, they revised their QIS. It's, uh, in Ohio, it's called Step Up to Quality. And they revised the QRIS to include program standards that address how early childhood educators are to share assessment results with families. So not just say that they will, but to talk specifically about how this can take place and how it can be done uh, more effectively. Um, so this will ensure that the families obviously have a better understanding <coughs> excuse me, of how their child is developing and learn learning and programs at higher levels of quality are also required to meet with the parent and family to develop educational goals based on the assessment results. Massachusetts, in an affiliated site of Help Me Grow, which this is a national program that connects parents and pediatricians and child care providers, they've actually distributed the Ages and Stages questionnaire and the Ages and Stages questionnaire social emotional toolkits to community agencies. So they basically gave them to these agencies, helped them use it, and, and, and encouraging this process of assessment to take place. Delaware has created a parent and community engagement work group, and they've implemented an engagement plan with multiple audiences to promote STARS. So they have a new website, they have a, a STARS logo, they've developed calendar events for outreach to families, they have promotional items that they share. Um, and parent brochures and magnets to put on the refrigerator, media training and, and outreach to providers 
in recruitment. And then finally, Wisconsin has a development of a progression of family engagement standards used to determine mandatory points across, um, across their uh, uh, TQIS star levels. So the idea here is that they're going, uh, I'm sorry, Wisconsin would not only do that, but then they would promote through a series of messages, they would target those messages in various ways to various groups to help people understand what this would mean for them. Uh, so thank you. I'm going to pass it on to, uh, uh, I believe it's Kirsten. Hello. Richard, can you hear me? I can. Wonderful. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here with everybody. I am um, going to talk a little bit about Head Start. And uh, next slide, please. So this is um, our Parent, Family, and Community Engagement Framework, which we put out in 2011. When I, when I talk about family engagement and Head Start, obviously there's a, a long history of, of family engagement in the program. And I'm thinking about it along two, um, two kind of uh, pathways, I guess, if you will. One is the organizational uh, aspects of the program that need to sort of be in place to support effective family engagement. And the other is the the relationship-based piece uh, contained in, in, uh, in the title of this webinar. Uh, and so those are two different kind of tracks. With regards to the framework, the PFCE for short framework, this is um, basically a roadmap or a theory of change. We start with the end in mind, which is of course that children are ready for school. And if they're an early head start, then they're um, building foundations for school readiness and their relationships with caring uh, family members or caregivers. And if we move from sort of backwards from that purple column to the blue column, those are our, what we refer to as our family outcomes or family engagement outcomes. And those are pretty well tied to the Head Start performance standards. So they were created in a way of sort of synthesizing the performance standards and the research and parent input and community input. Uh, and, and, that, and that's where we sort of netted out in terms of what we're really striving for around family engagement and Head Start and early Head Start. So looking at um, increased uh, financial well-being, health and safety for families, supporting the parent-child relationship uh, attachment, and uh, supporting families as lifelong educators. So that phrase of parents as their first child's first teacher which we use pretty consistently in Head Start and Early Head Start. The fourth area in the blue column I'm looking at is families as learners, and that really ties to uh, families and parents as adult learners, whether it be through parenting, but also for um, kind of dreams, aspirations, career, jobs, that kind of thing. We also have a strong emphasis on the engagement around transitions from um, early learning settings into kindergarten and early learning settings into other early learning settings. We also have this uh, highlighted area around family connections to peers and community, which really centers around um, social capital and peer-to-peer um, -peer networks and supports. And then lastly, families as advocates for their children in early learning settings and beyond, and leaders in uh, their community within the program as decision makers, etc. So those are really, when we talk about family engagement, it's really kind of a multi sort of faceted approach or set of outcomes that we strive for. It isn't a one size fits all. It's a sort of, um, you know, meeting, building a relationship with a family and figuring out which targeted outcomes or are, you know, most aligned with their goals and where they're at and what their needs are. If we back up from the blue column, we have the uh, pink column, a red column, and these are wh where we, uh, what we refer to as our program impact areas. So these are the sort of service components in the program that when aligned with the yellow column, which are really the drivers of change, program leadership, continuous program improvement, and professional development. When these elements in the yellow and red are sort of aligned, connected, there's strategies that are kind of consistent, then we're zero the changes that that programs are more likely to support families um, in the outcomes and, and, ha and have an effect on children's outcomes as well. So you know, it's kind of a roadmap. Uh, it's a really kind of an implementation tool for our Head Start performance standards. And um, there's a large focus on the 
purple arrow at the top, which is the positive and goal-oriented relationships that Moshe Miller also talked about in the Home Visiting Program, that being a, a driver, sort of both a mechanism of, of, of sort of implementing the work and an outcome that programs are striving for, such that um, shared responsibility and equal relationships kind of run itself through this framework. Um, it's based on some research, um, if folks are familiar with the longitudinal study out of Chicago, Tony Brick's research, that really found that there were five essential supports or subsystems that affected student outcomes over the long term in uh, educational achievement. And so um, because you know, those ingredients, if you will, or supports in that community were so aligned with what's available in the Head Start program, it really made sense to kind of tie some of these things together and so what we have um, here essentially is something that was developed with a lot of partners involved as a way to think about family engagement in a systemic and integrated way and comprehensive way on one hand and in a relationship-based way and on the other hand. Next slide, please. So, the PFCE outcomes, as I already mentioned, are really groupings of our regulations. And the regulations are in Head Start are locally interpreted and locally implemented. There are a lot of them, as those of you who are in Head Start know uh, or are familiar with Head Start. There's a lot of regulations. And there's a lot of rela regulations related to parents and families. And, um, but those, sometimes there are challenges in sort of implementing those in a way uh, that leads to effective family engagement rather than sort of randomness in family engagement. And so again, that was part of the impetus for creating a framework and supportive tools to help kind of programs think about, um, think about family engagement in a comprehensive and uh, integrated kind of way. The PFCE and TA resources are, like I said, regulation implementation tools. And the data sources that programs use to think about um, and set goals around uh, family engagement in partnership with families and as a program at large, a community at large, are usually gathered from uh, community assessment and uh, family assessment and from information gleaned from parents in terms of input on, uh, on the efficacy of services and, um, for themselves and their children. Next slide just going to say a few things about innovations. And um, I talked about this notion of systemic, integrated, and comprehensive. This is kind of becoming buzz, a buzz term for programs. And for, for us, it's been kind of a really central key message around the importance of when things are systemic, integrated, and comprehensive, we have the best chance to make the best difference uh, for families and for children. And um, so we're hearing a lot of different ways that programs are, are sort of implementing that. And we're seeing a lot, we're hearing a lot more um, partnerships between teachers and family advocates or family services staff on home visits. Um, we're seeing uh, family assessment, we're seeing more teachers involved in communication around goal setting and uh, more family services uh, folks more knowledgeable about child development and sort of more seamlessness around communication with families. Now obviously in a home-based home -based model, um, the, a lot of, you know, these kind of, sometimes the silos are less likely to happen. But in a center-based model where you have family services and teachers, a lot of programs have struggled with kind of creating this um, sort of seamlessness for families. So we're seeing, hearing a lot of um, shifts around that for programs. As far as positive goal-directed relationships, we're hearing lots of examples about um, how uh, program leadership is embracing relationship-based work or relationship-rooted practice and, and looking at ways to drive that through not just family partnerships, which has been the sort of traditional, you know, who does family engagement? Head Start, oh, the family workers. But it's actually something that teachers have an angle on, and family workers have an angle on, bus drivers have an angle on, and leaders have an angle on creating a program environment and expectation around relationship-based work and relationship-rooted practice. The third area here, the outcomes-based and data-driven, is something that I think we're, you know, data-driven is being really pushed, pushed on the teaching side. And we're also, um, trying to do a lot of TA around helping programs think about what difference what they do matters uh, or what difference what they're doing with regards to family work, family partnership work, 
um, what difference it's actually making. So trying to better understand the relationship between their strategies, priority staffing patterns, and kind of what effects there are. So helping programs make that shift from the measure of effect to a measure or a measure of effort only, which is very important, don't get me wrong, but to like sort of measures of effect and understanding what family progress might look like um, and all its variability, but still trying to help improve program processes as well as improve, make improvements for practice that support families the best and make the best change for families and children. So I, do, um, I did just include a couple of uh, resources here. Just the top right one is, a, is our simulation. And this is kind of like a gaming uh, kind of thing where you go in and uh, this is about sort of su supporting the attitudes associated with building relationships with families that are going to lead to the best engagement and the most um, receptivity from families. So you can kind of make different choices and see how the, um, the mom uh, you know, may turn away or feel like it's things that sort of shut the conversation down or open it up. And you can print out transcripts and that kind of thing. So programs are using this a lot in some of their pe professional development efforts. And then we do have a resource here called the Digital Markers of Progress in the lower left, the orange book there. And that's digital and also um, in PDF. But it's a way that programs can kind of look at levels of progress they're making. It defines different indicators across the framework for change in like program environment and um, community partnerships and um, you know, professional development. And programs can kind of look and rate themselves and see sort of where they are and make some, do some goal setting and action planning to make, kind of move their organizations in a direction that's more systemic, integrated, and comprehensive for more effective family engagement. So those are a few thoughts. I have lots of ideas and thoughts about. I'm excited to see the chat going on and look forward to more conversation about uh, you know, thinking about research and thinking about what works and doesn't. So on to the next. Okay, hi everybody. This is Letha Chum with the Office of Child Care, and thank you for having me today. Next slide, please. So the Office of Child Care has twin goals and refers here as described in the Child Care Development Fund is a block grant providing funding to state territories and tribes. And the, it's the primary source of funding for providing access to child care services in child care as well as all early childhood its settings. Um, it operates under twin principles that promote self-sufficiency by making child care more affordable for low-income families, as well as fostering healthy child development and school success by improving the quality of child care across early childhood settings. Next slide, please. So as you know, under a block grant, states have a lot of flexibility, which accounts for the variation across states as it relates to addressing um, issues related to consumer education. But the Office of Child Care tries to provide states with guidance by offering up these um, principles focused around um, improving health and safety in child care, improving the quality of child care, as well as establishing family-friendly provider policies. Part of our focus has been in the last couple of years has been on working with states and territories and tribes to set minimum health and safety standards and provide more detailed provider information for parents to allow them to make better informed child care choices, as well as to provide descriptive system and transparent methods of quality indicators like states working on ethics around QRS so that parents can differentiate between the quality of levels of child care providers have available for them in, in their community. On May 18th, the Office of Child Care, as you may know, um, prepared a notice of proposed rulemaking, NPRM as we referred to it, and it was the first effort in the last, since 1998, to make updates to the child care development regulations. The um, regulations have just closed for comment on August 5th, and those comments will be taken into consideration in terms of making um, revisions to the closed rule, and as it particularly relates to the area of health and safety, the quality of child care, and establishing family funding policies. Next slide, please. So um, as I indicated, um, any stations in this field are many and varied, and um, 
oftentimes ensure that parental choice and giving parents specific information needed for them to make informed choices is available. Um, they provide information for parents about the importance and availability of quality in early care and education settings and school-age settings. They facilitate connections with families by incorporating strengthening families and QRS for programs to, to implement and maintain practices related to the strengthening families' protective factors around parents' resiliency, knowledge of parenting and child development, concrete support in times of need, and social connections and social emotional competence of children. The other thing I will say is that, um, next slide, please. Okay, I kind of lost my place. So again, since their um, states are very much grappling with trying to find ways to measure the effectiveness of their efforts around um, informing parents' childcare choices, and we just last week we completed our um, state and territory meetings, and some very interesting key points were captured in our table discussions of states that I like to reference here. Um, they want to know um, about how to reach parents and how to help them make informed decisions and um, look at measurements that will help them to um, identify those factors. They're, they're not clear about how to specifically help parents to get effective information, whether they are able to grasp it or not, making sure that the, the um, information is concise and, and speaks to their needs in, order of, in, in terms of helping them making informed choices around child care. Um, they're looking at ways to um, move from a web-based consumer ed system into the 21st century, uh, how to bring information into a coordinated website that um, makes their search around childcare less time consuming, more informed, and, or, and also incorporating the information around quality rating systems and the, and the um, different quality of services that are available at the different levels so that they are making their choices and, and helping parents to choose quality childcare. They're looking at um, marketing strategies and how to create a system to en enhance parent aw awareness that is culturally sensitive and relevant. So with that, I would like to offer um, two resources that have been newly developed from the National Center on Child Care Quality Improvement. And um, I believe they're going to be um, sent to you in a separate email, but I'll reference them here. And those are Strengthening Families and QRS, which was um, released on May two of 2013, and then also the Consumer Ed and Child Care Options, which was just recently released in um, July. So with that, I'll hand it over to the next presenter. Hello, this is Rosie Gomez. I'm from the Children's Bureau in the Office, the office on Child Abuse and Neglect, and I will be sharing some of the frameworks that are available when thinking about family provider relationships as well as sharing some resources that you might find helpful. Next slide. So first, we're, there's a big focus on um, the protective factors when thinking about frameworks, especially in our child abuse prevention programs. And Lisa mentioned um, some of these protective factors. But I just wanted to mention three common frameworks that are used. The ACYF one is in development, but I'll still provide some information. So the first is CDC's Essentials for Childhood, Their Safe, Stable, and Nurturing Relationships, or SSNR. And I'm not re representing CDC, but wanted to mention this framework as we work very closely with them, and the framework provides a good explanation for the importance of relationships between children and their caregiver, their caregivers as it relates to maltreatment and other adverse exposures that occurred during childhood, and then of course is related to health outcomes. So this framework is based on young children experiencing their world through relationships with parents and caregivers. And these relationships are fundamental to the healthy development of the brain, as well as the development of physical, emotional, social, behavioral, and intellectual capacities. So 
obviously this framework is from a public health perspective. So with the promotion of the SSNRs, it's hopeful that relationships will be enhanced and that the health will be improved. So the three dimensions um, of the safe, stable, and nurturing of the SSNRs, they represent important aspects of the social and physical environment that protect children and promote their optimal development. So you can find more information about this uh, on the CDC's website. So we also work very closely with our national partners, including the Center for the Study of Social Policy, and they have a strengthening families approach, which includes the five protective factors, as mentioned before, uh, present parental resilience, social connections, concrete support in times of need, knowledge of parenting and child development, and social and emotional competence of children. So this framework emphasizes that uh, protective factors are also promotive factors that build family strength and a family environment that promotes optimal child and youth development. So we include these protective factors in our resource guide that I will mention on the next slide, but we have also added a sixth protective factor in our guide, which is nurturing and attachment. The last framework that I wanted to mention is the ACYF framework. So ACYF has been working with the Developmental Services Group, DSG, a contractor, to develop a protective factors framework to guide research, policy, and practice approaches aimed at increasing protection, enhancing resilience, and promoting healthy outcomes for children, youth, and families receiving services from ACYF. So they conducted a systematic literature review to identify protective factors across five ACYF populations. These are children and youth who are victims of child abuse or neglect, uh, runaways or homeless, in or transitioning from foster care, exposed to domestic or community violence, and pregnant or, and or parenting teens. And now they're in the process of developing a protective factors framework and tools that can be used, um, can be useful for policymakers, practitioners, and consumers. So we're really excited about this framework and hopefully there'll be more to come very soon in the next couple of months. Uh, we're also focused on well-being and have really infused this concept into our work over the last couple of years. So an information memorandum came out in April of 2012 explaining this concept in more detail, how ACYF is focused on the promotion of social and emotional well-being for children and youth receiving child welfare services, but also how we're working to encourage child welfare agencies focus on improving the behavioral and social emotional outcomes for children who have experienced abuse and neglect. So I've also included a link to the information memorandum. And you can find some more information. And lastly, I wanted to mention the comprehensive family assessment guidelines for child welfare. So this assessment is used as a guide to identify services that are specifically targeted to address the family's needs and problems, and then ensure the child's safety, well-being, and permanency. So these guidelines address the components of a comprehensive family assessment, show the linkages to service planning and service provision, and then illustrate how child welfare agencies can support their youth. So the guidelines are provided as an initial framework to facilitate efforts to move the child welfare community towards comprehensive assessment as a best practice. And I have included this link as well, and I really think it's a great resource for providers as they're working with families. Next slide, please. And one of the questions uh, regarding this encouraging flexibility in standards and regulations, we try to encourage flexibility through our grant opportunity announcements and through our program instructions. We try to encourage grantees to use evaluation tools or measures that best meet their population. Um, and a lot, of our, there are a lot of people who apply for our funding will put this into their application. Next slide, please.
Okay, so innovations from the field. Uh, I'm the Federal Project Officer for the Community-Based Child Abuse Prevention Program, also known as CBCAP. And this is funding that's given to each state for prevention programs and activities. And I think they're always finding new and innovative approaches as they work with families, especially uh, different types of populations within states such as tribal communities, refugees, uh, teen parents, or rural populations. So have I included, I've provided a link to the Friends National Resource Center's website. And Friends is a center that provides technical assistance to our CBCAP program. So there's a lot of information regarding the work that the states are involved in. But one document that I didn't include on the slide but wanted to mention is a document that you can find on this website under What's New. Um, and it's the CBCAP New Directions and Accomplishments document. It provides a snapshot of unique and exemplary practices implemented across the country. So as you can imagine, if you know, prevention funding is given to every state, just being able to have a document that shows some of the unique approaches can be really helpful. And CBCAP programs use funds for family resource centers, home visiting, respite care, uh, public outreach, parent leadership, which is really big, and then other prevention-focused programs. And a big emphasis is also on evaluation. And although I think it can be challenging to evaluate prevention programs, they're really making some great strides in this area. So please do visit the website and review the New Directions and Accomplishments Report. The second thing I wanted to mention was a protective factor survey. It's a pre-post evaluation tool for use with caregivers receiving child maltreatment prevention services. It's a self-administered survey that measures protective factors. And it's a product that the Friends National Resource Center developed in collaboration with the University of Kansas Institute for Educational Research and Public Service. And it was also developed with the advice and assistance from CBCAP grantees, parents, researchers, administrators, workers, and uh, experts specializing in family support and maltreatment and psychological measurement. Uh, and it's also in the process of being made available in Spanish. So we're excited for this, and hopefully that'll happen very soon. And lastly, I wanted to mention our resource guide that's created on an annual basis. And it's used to support service providers in their work with parents. And we um, include information on the protective factors. And then we have tip sheets for parents and caregivers at the end. Uh, and every year, we include different types of tip sheets based on feedback. So every year, we try to include uh, two to three new tip sheets, but always putting um, older tip sheets that are taken out on the website, the Child Welfare Information Gateway website. So thank you for your time, and please contact me if you have any specific questions. I think I'll turn it over to Monique. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Monique Toussaint, and I am the Family Engagement Lead at the U.S. Department of Education. My workload primarily focuses on aligning the efforts, initiatives, policies, and programs at the department around our vision for family engagement. We have spent the last few years taking a look at what could be done internally to support the field and working with families and institutions to promote family engagement. Starting with a policy forum in 2010, we met and gathered feedback from the field and discussed promising practices across the nation. While there was a variety of things to look at, one thing was certain. We need to shift our thinking about how we engage families and how we ask the field to do the same. With this new focus in mind, we reached out to top researcher Dr. Karen Mapp to help us examine the ways that we have been looking at family engagement to shift our gears and align our processes internally. After spending months uh, meeting with key stakeholders, senior officials, and various programs, Dr. Mapp developed a draft framework to help guide our internal process. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to note that this framework is still in draft mode and that we hope to finalize it in the coming months. My goal of sharing it with you is to help you to think about ways to work with providers and families to support student learning and capacity, student learning and development. So our draft framework is based on research and focused on capacity building. The focus is twofold. 
First, it focuses, in on, it focuses on building the capacity, the knowledge, skills, and abilities of learning providers to work with families. Second, it focuses on building the knowledge, skills, and confidence of families to support student learning and development. So what does that mean, right? Family engagement is a shared responsibility, not just the family's responsibility or the education provider's job. Everyone has a role. It's collaborative. Um, studies show that children who attend high-quality pre-K programs are more likely to graduate from high school. In the early learning realm, providers should examine whether or not the skills being taught position the children to excel in the K-12 arena. The department's emphasis on providing a quality education from cradle to career helps us to work to ensure that all children have access to high quality early education. To do this, we have to ensure that both families and learning providers are equipped to work together. By focusing on building the capacity of both entities, we can work together to provide outcomes that provide a learning environment conducive to maximizing the learning and development of children. But what are those outcomes? So providers, they should be able to cultivate and sustain active and effective partnerships with families, strengthening one of the identified supports, parent and community ties needed to support child learning and development. Providers and other staff should be able to respect and honor families' existing knowledge and their potential contribution of the work to the centers, have the skills, knowledge, and confidence to create a welcoming and inviting spaces for children and their families, and demonstrate a commitment to family engagement. For their families, we want them to develop their skills, knowledge, and confidence to negotiate uh, the roles of being effectively engaged, being engaged from cradle to career. Uh, effective engagement at this level enables them to be, a, to be effective across the life of their children's education, which is our hope, and to feel honored and respected by school staff. So this focus on capacity building must be supported by a system. And this system should be systemic and linked to learning, right? So for example, providers should engage families in a meaningful way to allow them to interact with their children at home that helps them to master their cognitive skills, ABCs, color shift, etc. Early learning providers have to integrate the importance of working with families and provide professional development for staff to understand, respect, and interact effectively with families to share the responsibility for child development. When both parties are armed with the resources that they need to work together, their confidence is exuded and exemplified in the way that they function within the necessary conditions for success. Effective partnerships can ensure that children are supported in developing the vocabulary and pre-literacy skills needed to make the critical transition from learning to read to reading to learn in the third grade. Next slide. So what are these conditions? So in, in order to enable these conditions, we conducted an internal audit of all our programs and policies. Uh, overall, the three major components that we, we wanted to focus on was being systemic, integrated, and sustained. By systemic, I mean being purposely designed as a core component of educational goals, such as school readiness. Being integrated into the structures and processes of training and development, teaching and learning and community collaboration, and being sustained. So it goes beyond the funding, right, and being a part of it, and providers are committed to having family engagement as a part of what they do. Because of that, we are now working better together across the department to ensure collaboration across programs that have components related to family engagement. So this includes working with programs on the language that they use um, in their notices and vetted applications when they're published, um, helping to ensure that grantees across programs that have similar goals are working towards uh, retaining uh, what we identify as common things we want to do in family engagement, especially as it pertains to capacity building, while giving them the flexibility to be to complete the goals of the individual programs. And then looking at the resources that we have at the disposal. So we have a lot of different programs that have spent resources or attained resources in this area, but we haven't done such a great job of aligning it. So making sure that those resources are aligned in a way to uh, assist the way that programs are implemented, how we communicate about the importance of family engagement, and how we promote it all together. And, we want, and, fi and finally, we want to ensure that the work that we do is being measured effectively. We want to allow uh, grantees the flexibility to evaluate as applicable for their programs while retaining the emphasis on evaluating the impact that quality family engagement has on the overall success on academic achievement. Next slide. When, token, when taking a look at the best practices in the family engagement realm, 
many that we look at here at the department are those that incorporate a few essential components, so relationship building, effective community partnerships, access, understanding, and use of data, so not just giving the, the data to the parents, but making sure they understand it, and a home visit component. Uh, for example, Stanton Elementary School in Washington, D.C. use a combination of teacher home visits and the, the academic parent-teacher teams out of Creighton, Arizona, to turn around a, low, a learning environment where there's a high level of hostility between families and staff, as well as low academic achievement. Once families and learning providers begin to form a relationship outside of the classrooms, they could then work better together to support the learning that took place inside the classroom. A uh, parent university in Boston provided parents and caregivers with information about the vital responsibility in shaping children's lives. The parent, use of, the parent university sessions focus on child development, what children are learning, advocacy, parent leadership, and effective parenting skills. So while this spans the, the K-12 to and pre-K part of um, the life of the child in school, uh, the key component for a parent university in the, early, in the early learning realm was the parent as teacher's component that provided a clear understanding of how children grow and learn and the teaching and learning approaches used uh, by Boston Public Schools. So in both programs, educators work to ensure that families understood what was taking place in the learning environment and how to recreate or support it at home. This is the premise of effective family engagement. And so in closing, I just want to thank you for your time and your work to helping us provide access to high quality early, early learning because what you do helps us uh, help them to be success successful in the K-12 realm. And now I want to turn it over to Nancy. Great. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and we have about 20 minutes now. Could we forward the slides to the last one, please? Uh, to the next one, please? Could you forward to the next slide? Thanks. So these are the discussion questions that we raised at the beginning. Um, I have seen a lot of questions come up. Um, I don't know if we'll get a chance to answer them all or address them all, but I'm gonna, we're going to do our best. Um, so uh, I think I'll just start at the beginning. Um, we had one comment that uh, using systems of care values and principles, how do in a meaningful way do we involve family members in policy development, implementation, and evaluation? Um, I was wondering if anyone wanted to address that from the presenters. Any thoughts? That's a great question. <laughs> but I think <laughs> I would need some time to think about that to come up with a good answer. <laughs> that. I mean, I'm, I guess this is Kirsten Beigel. I would, there's a couple of assumptions I'd have to make in the in the question, meaning that um, maybe folks are having like a hard time at policy levels um, implementing meaningful parent family engagement. That's my assumption on the question. But um, and I think you know, thinking of the system of care values, things being family driven uh, or child driven, depending on the situation, and individualized and evidence based. I you know, I think that sometimes. It, and thinking about culture and language, what is sort of the accessibility of the opportunity for family members? Because um, it, takes, it can take um, time orienting people who are new to uh, a group or a set of goals to, to kind of feel comfortable, and, it, and, and that takes a level of prioritization for people who are coordinating things. So I think the first step is, is, is thinking about how do you create an environment for discussions around policy change that um, have that sense of mutuality, that have that, um, as I, I think I heard in, the, in the, um, maybe the beginning of the presentation around uh, somebody's comment around, you know, we're not better than them, like we're sort of all equals in this, and kind of creating that quote unquote environment. I think you have to do the foundational things to 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 welcome that participation. And then those conversations when the safety is established and um, you know can flow and, and you can really hear what people think. <laughs> A lot of groundwork I think has to be done in the beginning. 
But again, and so I just kind of answered – sometimes with these you know, questions on chat, you sort of answer the question you think you want to answer because you're not exactly sure what some of the nuances are. So I, I don't know if other folks want to jump in. Maybe they thought about it differently. Well, this is Rosie Gomez. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. And I was going to say, I think this really goes back to parent leadership and finding – having programs find those parents that are natural leaders and those parents that can be cultivated to be leaders to sit on work groups, to sit on boards, and you know, make them be those people in the community that can influence policy somehow or help with the evaluation or implementation of programs. So I think parent leadership is a big piece. And this is Richard Gonzalez. I mean, building off of what Kirsten said already, I think really the whole th the, the mistake we make is we think all we have to do is pull parents together and tell them we're going to make policy decisions with them and we want them to be participating. And we have, we have not taken time to build relationship, to build trust, to learn about one another, to learn what this is all about. And so that element of time is essential if you're going to get to meaningful involvement. It's, it's like any other relationship, um, whether it's family relationships or, or work relationships with your colleagues. It takes time. And it can't just get jumped into. There are preliminary steps that have to be taken. I just wanted, this is Nancy, I want to jump in and just say, um, so I know that, that the um, uh, participants, that you can't see the questions, they're coming just to the presenters. Um, so I just want to say that there are a number of people who are writing in and agreeing with what you guys are saying, that you need time to, um, you know, you need to, to talk to the parents and you need to develop these strong relationships in order to make these kinds of things work. And then too, this is Monique, I just wanted to jump in and say beyond, beyond that for us, it, we, our work with Karen helped us to see that we needed to equip the parents to be able to have the right conversation, ask the right questions to help those relationships and to equip the, well we say teachers and you guys say providers, right, different scope, but the learning providers with the ability to, to interact with those parents because they don't necessarily know how to work with the families of, I would say, lower income backgrounds. So making sure that on both sides that everyone feels equipped to work together um, and has the skills that they need to do so. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to move on to, I want to share some comments that have been shared because I think that they um, uh, cut across a number of these, um, would apply to a number of different types of programs. Um, one is that someone commented that um, early care and education, professional education on supporting parenting and the parenting relationship between the parent and child is needed. That most um, early care and education providers um, receive, at least in this person's state, receive little education on parent education. And that that could be an area for focus that would help. Um, and Sorry, I'm trying to scan through these. Uh, also, someone commented that continuing to provide relationship-based training, coaching to caregivers is a priority for improving family provider um, relationships. One strategy that seems to work well in um, early Head Start family care option is when the child development specialist has experience with being a family partnership coordinator. For instance, when she shares what's going on with the families, provider attitudes are affected. Home visits by caregivers also really make a difference. Um, someone else shared that um, the way that one way that researchers can help is by providing um, information um, on how to use participatory research methods to integrate parents' perspective into program evaluation, um, which uh, being a researcher myself, I, I think is a great idea. Um, someone else has asked for research on child outcomes when families are engaged would provide important information, and I know this is something that we are, have all I know that I have many conversations about with um, the various people on the phone and something that we are all interested in and trying to promote. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Kirsten, I'm thinking of you. Which one? Uh, okay. Research on child outcomes um, when families are engaged would provide important information to the field. Yeah, the connections between like, family outcomes and child outcomes. I'm yeah. not looking at the question now. but. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think what I, you know, I think we know a lot about connections between family well-being and, and children's learning and development and uh, parent attachment and parenting and children's learning and development and um, things related to, you know, 
adult learners and uh, you know folks with m more education, and that's you know relationship to child and learning and over the long haul and um, you know, so there, there are outcomes that we know a lot about, and there are some outcomes and areas where we know less. So we know a lot less about the relationship from the research perspective between parent leadership and advocacy and children's learning and development. Um, we, I think we, we prioritize it because we, we, we know pretty you know, instinctively that it makes a difference. But I don't think we know that much about it from the research standpoint. We do know a lot about um, parent networks on social capital and that's effect on uh, families and children's learning and development. But you know, we and of course we know a lot from the you know, the K twelve research about engagement around academic you know, academics and homework and that kind of thing and its effect on children's academic success. So there are there are areas where we we know about those connections, but what we know less about, I think, is how you get there in sort of the practice. And you know, thinking about the parent family and community engagement framework and Head Start, you know, what are the what is the sort of pathway of practices that really help help secure that um, those changes? I think we know less about about that. Um, and I know you know we know a lot about the relationship based work in terms of of effect on engagement and i and i don't we haven't talked about the family provider a measure uh that that we're prioritizing as sort of an innovative approach but i I do think one of the challenges is also and aside from the research in the areas I said where I feel like there's a little paucity, we have like a lot we don't have a lot of um access in the field to measures around some of these outcomes that are pre for practice use by providers that can really help them better understand how you know, the practices are working. So I think that's an, also an area where we could, uh, we could, we could really um, stand to, to benefit. Yeah. No, and thank you. I, w um, I actually was going to bring up um, the measure that OPRE is um, developing in conjunction with Westat and Child Trends and other consultants um, uh, with funding from the Office of Head Start. Uh, it's a family provider relationship measure of family provider relationship quality, um, and it's, uh, designed to, will, it's designed to, cut a, to um, be used in Head Start, uh, center-based child care, and family-based child care. Um, and we are actually uh, just finished up pilot testing and are going to go into a field test in the fall. And the project is due to end September next year. So um, we will have, um, you know, we have drafts of measures that have been submitted to OMB, so you could access them. But the final measure that has really been psychometrically tested will um, will be out next year. And we look forward to everyone, practitioners and and you know, researchers taking it up um, because while we've done a ton of work to try to get it to a real, in really good shape, it's going to need um, even more testing out there and so and use out there to really see how it's you know how it's working so um, we encourage you all to be looking for that in the future um, Ma Margie, um this is Richard mm -hmm. um, just I, I was in based on what you guys just said it just it I'd like to kind of answer one of the questions that you had thrown up before about what trends are you seeing related to family provider relationships mm -hmm. and because I think it speaks to what what's already been said you know for a long time when you thought family engagement or you heard family engagement, people just thought Head Start. And what you see happening now, I think, anyhow, is more recently all programs, all grants, all initiatives are beginning to understand and focus on the aspect of the relationship between families and providers, and in that, in that it's a two-way communication, and they're beginning to have expectations and grants about, about this being a piece of whatever is developed. Even if you look at the President's initiative, what's talking about, uh, someone, one of the questions that came in before, someone said something about, well, could you take the Head Start performance standards and you could, could you apply them or, we, or make them a requirement for child care and for other places? And if you look at the President's initiative, for example, you see that uh, in the early Head Start child care partnership model, the idea is to enhance quality and to expect family child care or center child care to actually uh, meet the standards that would be supported by Early Head Start and meet the standards. If you look at the pre-K piece, there's an expectation that there would be, that there would be a more uh, comprehensive approach to programming, which includes the focus on the relationship of family and, and greater engagement. And more recently, 
even with the Waste at the Top Early Learning Challenge, the Department of Education and, and, and HHS and Administration for Children and Families, we began, it was a while ago, but we've drafted a joint statement on family engagement where we're trying to finalize that so that we could generate a statement from both departments that say both of our departments feel family engagement is really important, and here are some of the principles we want to support in all our funding efforts going forward. So I think there really is a, uh, a, a trend now that's challenging all of us to think about how to, to focus more intentionally on the family provider relationship piece. And I and I and this is Monique and I want to echo Richard in saying that that is so important because what happens there is often reflected in their level of engagement as they as they move on to the K to twelve world, right? And so the family provider relationship is critical because it, it just it just plays such a huge impact on how much parents engage as they as families engage as they as their children move up through the line. And so even at the department beyond early learning, we're looking at family engagement throughout all of our programs from again cradle to career. So that's that's very on point, I think, Richard. Mm -hmm. And this is Letha and um I neglected to say that childcare uses the term consumer education and um family engagement kind of interchangeably. But what's happening now in states as we put more of an emphasis on um, fostering healthy child development and um, the importance of low-income kids being in high-quality care, it's more than just providing information to parents, but it's providing information to parents in a transparent and simplified way that they can then take and access those quality services. It, that to really clearly inform their choices, and that's really where states are. So how is it that they transform their systems like their R&R systems to offer more transparent services at a level where parents can understand the importance of their involvement in and in, in their child care's education and then also in, in understanding how to make choices based on quality versus a convenience or those other factors that they make their child that they may make their child care choices around. And Lisa, while you're while you're talking, one of the questions that came in before had to do with a clarification when you were talking about the NP uh, the, uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking for for child care. Um, what was meant by family friendly policies? And I think that kind of is in keeping with what you just talked about. But what are the kinds of elements that? we mean when we're talking about family-friendly policies. So I don't know if you feel comfortable talking to that or you want me to, but I noticed the question as I was strolling down. Well, I could take a stab at it, and you can add on to it if you, if you could. And so sure. what we mean by family-friendly policies is subsidy policies within states that offer information to parents at the time they qualify them for child care services so that when they're making their choices, they have the information that they need to make informed choices to choose quality care. So that's one of the um, areas we address when we talk about family-friendly policies. Yeah, and I think, and I think, I mean, many of you know in your states that the, that there's different, uh, for example, even in terming, uh, in, in terming, in determining eligibility, the redetermination period is different from state to state. So some of what we talk about is, for example, uh, hopefully reducing the, the burden on families by having uh, them move to a 12-month redetermination period or reducing, uh, allowing for waivers, uh, parent co-pays to be waived, or allowing time for job search so that when a parent loses a job, um, they don't automatically lose their, their child care, but they have a period of time where they can look for a job and show that work being done. It's all of these elements, as, as Letha mentioned and, and, and the examples I just gave, it's all how do you begin to do things that don't seem to create more pressure on parents as you're trying to support the CCDF program and yet allow for the flexibility within states to make the decisions that they need to make. So, Amarji, I'll turn it back over to you. I'm sorry I hijacked it for a moment, but... No, that was great, and we actually just have a couple um, more minutes. Um, I did want to highlight one other question that came in. Um, 
uh, which was focused on discussion question three, um, it seems there's a relative gap in the research on the topic of health and well-being of early childhood providers and organizations. And uh, often overlooked is the provider's wellness, um, so emotional, mental, and physical, and the health of the organization for developing positive relationships between providers and families. Um, and I just wanted to say that that, that is definitely something that um, we are discussing, or that I've heard in conversation about, about uh, concerning home visiting. I know we're collecting data um, on that in our national evaluation of the home visiting program. Also in Head Start, we're trying to collect that information. Are there other offices that are focused on this? Um, and want to so, briefly so, just comment? So to be honest, so there is an early, there's a federal early childhood workforce right now that meet members who meet across our federal agencies within ACF and, and within HHS um, and Ed and some other, Department of Ed and some other agencies are also included. And what we're doing is looking at mental health issues, resources we have available that could be shared uh, across our programs, what to do not only, uh, not only in terms of part of the focus because of recent disasters that have occurred and the resources do we have to share, but then we're expanding the conversation to say what other mental health supports or what other uh, ways can we support staff in a way that they are better prepared to talk about the issues that I impact them and the families that they serve. Great. Um, since it is, my, my clock is saying it's 4 o'clock, and so I want to respect everyone's time. I just wanted to um, thank you all for participating. I want to remind you that um, at the end of the uh, webinar, we're going to be sending out a survey with the three discussion questions. Um, and so um, if you want to provide additional answers or responses to these, um, we really please do. Um, we will definitely be looking at them. Um, we will also be posting the webinar on, um, uh, after, uh, on a website, and we will send out information to everyone um, so you can access the slides and, and, um, and other materials. Um, so is there, a, you know, Lou, are there any other um, final logistical things that you want to share? No, very good. Thank you. Okay. I, could I just, Margie, could I just say, I just want to say to everybody who participated, I've been on lots of webinars, and usually there's like three questions in the chat box. I really want to commend this group for sending in comments and questions and suggestions, because I don't think I've seen this many in the last ten webinars that I've been on. Yeah, we really, really appreciate your engagement in this um, and, your con and your interest in these topics, and we hope that this conversation can continue, um, and we will do our best to facilitate that. Um, so thank you to all the presenters. Thank you to all of the um, audience participants. Um, and, uh, oh, uh, and Nancy, will you invite yes. us, the presenters, to your next one, please? To your next what? Invite us to your next webinar to, to participate, not to present. Yes, we definitely will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you, everyone, um, and have a great day. Right, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, care. everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the conference call for today. We thank you for your participation, and as I please disconnect your line.